Hi, welcome from Kona, Hawaii. Uh, my name is David McGuire. I'm the director and founder of Shark Stewards, and we are part of the Earth Island Institute based in Berkeley, California. We're an international nonprofit funding large sharks and rays and trying to save them from extinction, as well as protect the habitat that they live in. So welcome to Endangered Species Day. I'm just going to uh, introduce because we have an incredible lineup of conservationists, scientists, adventurers, explorers uh, that work with some of the most important, some of the most amazing, and some of the most threatened or endangered species on the planet. Okay. I'm going to do a little screen share first, so you don't have to look at the background here. Well, welcome to uh, Endangered Species Day. Um, it's not quite a celebration, but it is a day for us all to be present, cognizant, and uh, maybe celebrate the amazing biodiversity of Earth and, of course, the other 71%, the ocean, and the animals and plants that live in it. So as I said, I'm David McGuire. I'm the director of Shark Stewards, and we work to protect threatened sharks and, and raise elasma branks primarily, but also where they live. And we apply science education towards policy and advocacy. So we're going to have a call to action, several call to act, calls to action here uh, in this. And we'll put those links in the Facebook uh, uh, chat and also post later. And you can see this in its entirety on Facebook at Shark Stewards, but also on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So I wanted to briefly introduce our guests. And then we'll have a question and answer. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. We have some from our students uh, in advance. And don't be shy because we have an incredible resource. And if you want to take action, we will give you the links to the, our organizations uh, present here. And you can go to their website. You can volunteer. You can take action. You can donate because we're all nonprofits and we all need your support and in any way that we can get it. Briefly, and I'll give you a better bio once I just talk about Endangered Species Day, but we have Mark Palmer, my colleague and friend. He's the Associate Director of the International Marine Mammal Project and part of the Earth Island Institute. Uh, Kristen Monsell, and she is an attorney uh, with the Oceans Program at, for the Center of, for Biological Diversity. Vince Smith, my good friend and dive buddy, he's the founder of Blue Endeavors, a nonprofit that works in ocean education, science, and conservation. Mariano Castro, uh, he's a law and policy or legal advisor uh, for the Turtle Island Restoration Network in Latin America. And he's going to help uh, kind of get into the migratory species down in the, what we call the Hammerhead Highway, but the Cocos Island Swimway. Uh, Dr. Robert Rubin, uh, distinguished professor, biologist, early uh, uh, manta ray researcher. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the science and also conservation, as well as 40 years plus of his experience with these incredible rays. And then last but not least, Simon Christopher calling in from Borneo, Malaysian Borneo, to talk about some of the work that's going on in Asia and the conservation work that actually Shark Stewards has been working with for eight years, as well as uh, some of the partnerships that have been going on and building, uh, not just for marine protection and shark protection or sea turtle protection, but also around plastics and having Blue Hope, which is the name of his organization. So welcome all. Um, we'll give you a chance to speak five or 80 minutes. I'll give you a prompt. I'll make, I'll do, put something in the chat. Uh, if we go over, it's okay if people are into it because it's people who are interested in how the conversation, the better it is, because this is a pretty serious day to recognize an extremely serious event that's occurring on our planet. The Earth is currently experiencing its sixth major extinction event. This is the age of the Anthropocene. Around 20% of the world's mammals and around 40% of amphibians are extinction, primarily due to us. Uh, habitat destruction, overexploitation, climate change, overfishing, pollution, plastic, you name it. Don't your seat because we're going to offer you some solutions because we're not giving up. We've all been working our whole lives to protect these animals and plants, and we want you to join in. Currently, more than 3,000 species of animals are considered endangered in the U.S. The U.S. Endangered Species Act that 
Kristen Monsell will speak about was passed uh, in 1973 to help uh, address this degradation and decline of species. There are around three times more endangered species than as, as there were, I mean, now as there were 10 years ago, including sharks. So a paper just came out in Nature that suggests 71% of populations has disappeared of oceanic shark and ray populations in the last half century, primarily due to overfishing. So that means oceanic uh, white tips, large migratory species, hammerhead sharks, manta rays, and other just incredibly beautiful and important sharks and rays. 77% of oceanic shark and ray populations are threatened with extinction. Uh, and it's time to take action now. We are losing these species almost faster than we can save them. Uh, I will talk a little bit about functional diversity and the importance of these marine megafauna at the end and to save these big animals, which include whales, include sea turtles, and include uh, a lot of the big fish that we are working to save. So this is an ocean crisis, but we have the ability and the tools to come to a solution. And we're going to come to that today. So first of all, I would like to introduce Mark Palmer of the Earth Island Institute International Marine Mammal Project. He's been cultivating in the background and uh, we work very closely together as projects as well as international projects. So Mark has been working for at least 45 years. You Mark, but you've spent most of your life lobbying, working in conservation, working overseas in Japan. Uh, working in tuna in the, the Central Pacific and tropical West Pacific. Uh, your work focuses on protecting whales and dolphins with an emphasis on planning, including uh, legislative advocacy. We both work with Center for Biological Diversity, sometimes trying to nudge uh, agencies to obey the laws that are in place. Uh, but we're grassroots organizers, both of us. And, and uh, so you've been the director also of Earth Island's uh, dedicated to protecting wildlife and wild places throughout California and the West. So welcome, Mark. Can you share us what you, share with us what we're doing lately? Thank you, uh, David, and thanks everybody for uh, signing on. I appreciate the effort and, and this Endangered Species Day. Uh, looking at the great whales uh, and uh, the dolphins and some of the endangered species that we have amongst these, traditional problem we had uh, with whaling, uh, it is the poster child, if you will, for over-exploitation that has occurred uh, throughout the oceans and is still occurring in many cases. Uh, during the 19th and 20th century, we saw the decimation of large numbers of great whales uh, by uh, The good news is that uh, with the end of whaling, it hasn't quite petered out totally, but most of the whaling has been ended. Uh, we're seeing from a number of these species. Uh, the photograph that you see uh, is a uh, humpback whale that I photographed this last Friday in Monterey Bay. Uh, most of the humpback whales were wiped out off the coast of California. Tremendous comeback uh, in the last few years. Uh, if I get the next slide, uh, David, uh, we're also working uh, to see about some of the current hazards of these animals. This is a, a blue whale fluke also shot last week. Uh, whales have been uh, increasing in numbers along the coast of California. And we're just starting to see some kind of indication that they're starting to increase in Antarctica, where again, they were horribly uh, butchered in large numbers. But these whales are not out of the woods yet, as you can imagine. There are such problems. Uh, the major problem for dolphins and whales is the entanglement of other types of uh, fishing gear. We have the vaquita in the north uh, of the Sea of Cortez. It looks like it'll be endangered uh, and wiped out in the, just the next few years. We also have the North Atlantic right whale. Uh, which is entangled uh, mostly in fishing gear, lobster traps, as well as some of the gill nets that are set on the bottom on the coast. So we still have huge problems with these. We're seeing pollution problems, such as with the southern resident orcas in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this species is seriously endangered, depleted by the captivity industry. 
and uh, has not uh, grown very much because of the double whammy of not having enough sound and the pollution problems that are occurring out of Puget Sound. Global warming is increasingly a problem. Uh, next slide, David, if you can. Okay. Uh, this is the bill, uh, which uh, has shown periodic die-offs along our coast, and a lot of people think it's because of food uh, losses in the Arctic due to global warming and the changes the environment there. So we have these major problems. We have ship strikes. We have uh, pollution. We have the entanglement problems. What is the solution? Well, the solution is in part, we need your help in helping get a hold of members of the uh, Congress and uh, state legislatures, members of other governments around the world. We need you to contact the companies that are involved in, for example, the production of fishing nets uh, and the production of plastics that go into the building of these fishing nets. One solution, for example, that we're considering at Earth Island is setting up an international fund that can pay these grassroots uh, fishermen not to fish. So provide them with an alternative. There's my gray whale. Uh, a little bit of a uh, stick in his neck out. Uh, the uh, the whole problem comes down to uh, politics, the proper authorities to go forward. I mentioned a big fund, an international fund to pay fishermen not to fish. Who's going to fund that? Well, we think the plastic uh, industry should fund We think, which is the oil companies, they have very deep, they're manufacturing these plastics that are causing the problem in the first place. And of course, there's the net manufacturers and the plastic line manufacturers as well. So uh, these companies should help solve the problem that they have indeed. I'm going to uh, stop there. Uh, hope uh, you can help us out by becoming active with our organization, with these organizations that I'm here with. By all means, uh, provide them with donations. Make sure you sign their petitions and uh, write letters to your members of Congress when we prompt you. Thanks very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions after. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we did have some, seeing some of these images, I'm going to quickly go through the blue whale fluke and the humpback that migrated to our National Marine Sanctuary at the Greater Farallons, as well as the Cordell Bank. We'll talk to about that a little bit with Dr. Rubin. Uh, this is a really amazing place with uh, incredible richness, thanks to the upwelling, but also species diversity. So that's amazing. You just saw these animals last week. I mean, yeah. And of course, our friend, the California gray whale, speaking of extinction, was on the endangered species list. As an undergraduate, I helped study these back in the 80s, and they're now been removed. That population has recovered. So Kristen Mons is next from the Center for Biological Diversity. Welcome, Chris. Kristen worked as an assistant attorney general in the natural resources section. And Chris is going to work on whales and uh, in the Northeast Pacific, and as well as the, the North Atlantic and threats and solutions. So Kristen. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and, and for having me, David. Um, marine species and through the Endangered Species Act and also through trying to save the, the, the Endangered Species Act from the horrible uh, rollbacks that we saw the Trump I apologize in advance I am a lawyer so this is going to be a little more heavy of, of a presentation but there's also pictures of critters so <laughs> um, as, as Mark was saying, like there are a um, there's an incredible um, threats facing our our marine species and whales in particular, um, including ship strikes and entanglement in commercial fishing gear. Fortunately, we have a very powerful tool in the Endangered Species Act to to help and try and abate some of those threats. The Endangered Species Act is widely considered the most comprehensive legislation for the preservation of endangered species ever enacted by any nation. Its plain intent is to protect, conserve, recover these species. 
no matter the cost. And it, the act is jointly administered by both the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service, depending on the species at issue. And the Fisheries Service has jurisdiction over most marine species. And we use the, the ESA um, at, at the center in a variety species from a variety of threats, um, including ship strikes, both in the Pacific Ocean and in the Atlantic Ocean, and to protect um, whales um, off both coasts from getting tangled up and killed in commercial fishing gear. But in order to be able to do so, a species first needs to be protected under the, the ESA. And Section 4 establishes the listing process for, for these species. Uh, species can be protected as either threatened or endangered. Um, and the, the statute enumerates the various threats that a, the agencies need to consider in evaluating whether or not a species meets one of these two definitions, including um, habitat destruction or over for commercial or, or other um, purposes or really just any threat. Um, it also requires the agency to generally designate critical habitat when it lists the species. So the, um, it, the animals themselves are protected, but then also the habitat areas on which they depend are also protected and also requires the agencies to develop recovery plans um, that then and um, is basically like a roadmap for how these species can um, can become recovered, no longer threatened with extinction and removed from from the ESA. Chris, excuse me, can you share your screen again? Because it looked like it just dropped off. Oh, is that what what happened? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Great. <clears throat> Um, so section seven is um, one of the one of the provisions that we use a lot at, at the center to try and protect marine species. Um, and it's considered the heart of the ESA for all federal agencies. Um, and the provision that we use the, the most is the uh, section 7A2, which is the provision that requires all federal agencies to consult with either Fish and Wildlife Service or NIMS. And that they're taking won't jeopardize a listed species or result in the destruction or adverse critical habitat. Um, section nine is another provision that is um, that is um, one we we use a lot, and this, in contrast, applies to anyone. So you and me, in addition to agencies, and it prohibits any person from taking, which is broadly defined as harming, harassing, killing uh, uh, endangered species. Um, and importantly, that permits an activity that leads to take can be liable for, for that take as well. So for example, in the state of California, Dungeness crab activity that was killing humpback whales, blue whales, and leatherbacks took them to court under this provision of, of the ESA, which led to the implementation of um, mitigation measures that previously didn't exist that help reduce the risk of um, future entanglements. And the agency actually just recently closed the crab fishery um, more, than, more than a month early under the terms of our settlement agreement and the mitigation program that, that was set were um, a lot of whales coming coming to California at a time when there was still thousands upon thousands of, of crab lines in the in the water. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, as I alluded to at the beginning, the, the Trump administration took um, a pretty massive wrecking ball to the regulations implementing the Endangered Species Act that have been in place for for forty plus years. Um, and that list on your screen there is just some of the um, various changes that they made that heed the effectiveness of this of this amazing piece of. Well, um, they they enacted a definition of the foreseeable future for for a threatened species that raises the bar for listing as threatened, and we've actually seen this play out in. Um, one of um, 
one, one species that we've been trying to get listed under the ESA, the Pacific walrus. Um, the agency used this new definition of foreseeable future to say, well, yes, their sea ice habitat is going to completely disappear, but we don't know for sure how they're going to respond to that loss of habitat. They might be able to adapt to an entirely new land-based existence. So we're not going to list them as, as threatened. And we're currently challenging um, that decision in court and waiting on a, waiting on a decision. Another um, one is um, changes to Section 7, that consultation process, um, which um, allows reliance on the promise of, of promise of future mitigation measures, which we're seeing that play out right now in the North Atlantic right whale context, where the agency just issued a draft biological opinion analyzing the impacts of um, ongoing entanglements of the species. And they said, yes, you know, this, the species is really endangered and um, entanglements are a huge part of that problem. And we need to protect every individual whale to ensure the survival and recovery of the species. But we're going to let fisheries um, keep entangling and killing these whales and we'll deal with, with this problem in the future. We'll will come up with future uh, regulatory um, amendments. So these rollbacks are, are bad to say the least, but um, fortunately um, they, the underlying statutory provisions are still in place and we're still using them. Entanglements from ship strikes and, um, and they're, they're, we took the Trump administration to court to challenge the regulatory rollbacks, and that um, that litigation is is pending right now. And the Biden administration is actually reviewing those rules and has um, indicated that they're going to be uh, repealing them. So the the lawsuit is uh, stayed um, while the Biden administration um, reviews them. So we're hopeful that either will in this lawsuit or um, the Biden administration will um, not only re repeal the horrible Trump rollbacks, but, but, but make the regulations even, um, even better. So lots of, lots of things that um, you all could do to help that. But, you know, one, one thing would be to write the Biden administration and urge them to repeal these horrible uh, Trump rollbacks. And I will stop there. Happy to answer okay. any questions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Let me just do an introduction real quick again. So I apologize to those of you watching us on Facebook Live. We just had a little technical difficulty, but we're back uh, on Endangered Species Day. Hi, I'm David McGuire, Director of Shark Stewards with the Earth Island Institute. And we've got several experts and uh, adventurers and divers and explorers, and most importantly, activists to protect endangered marine megafauna. So happy Endangered Species Day. We're going to uh, speak with Mariano Castro now from uh, the Turtle Island Restoration Network, live from Guatemala, telling us about the Cocos Galapagos Swimway. So welcome, Mariano, over to you. So greetings from Central America. Um, thank you very much for letting me share this great initiative to protect highly migratory species with you. Um, to begin, Let's place ourselves in the Eastern Tropical Pacific, um, specifically in the waters between Ecuador and Costa Rica. Um, as you may be aware, this is some of the most biodiverse regions in the world, um, but sadly, it's also one of the most threatened places due to overfishing. And this is precisely where the story begins. Um, for several years, scientists have been trying to better understand the behavior, the migratory routes, the habits of different species, um, particularly of sea turtles and sharks. Um, the result of this research uh, have shown some amazing things and particularly some great um, results for the protection of these species. And one of these results is that uh, researchers discovered that several of these species use a marine, a submarine superhighway to move between biodiversity hotspots. In this case, I'm speaking specifically about Cocos Island in Costa Rica and Galapagos in Ecuador. Um, the whole world 
knows these two places because of, of how nature blooms here, um, the rich biodiversity, incredible wildlife. And precisely the governments of both countries decided to protect these places uh, because of this. So you can see um, in my screen where Cocos Island is and you can see uh, some sort of rectangle, um, like a white or gray rectangle that surrounds Cocos Island. That's Cocos Island National Park. Um, in the case of Galapagos, you can also see a big chunk here, which is the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And this has been a big effort from governments, conservationists, international community to protect several endangered species, such as leatherback sea turtles, green turtles, scallop hammerheads, um, silky sharks, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a big issue here. Um, we know that highly migratory species don't stay in the same place all their lives. So what happens when these species leave the safety of the limits of these MPAs. And, and this is precisely what we're trying to address with the Cocos Galapagos Swimway. So when all these species leave these MPAs, um, I guess that a simple answer and sad answer as well is that they're vulnerable to industrial fishing. And the case is that they swim in the open ocean. Um, this is a very active place in which the main economic activity, it's fishing. Uh, we have persinners here, longliners. And, and the whole issue is that species like scallop hammerhead sharks are disappearing because of these fishing practices. So, um, and, and probably before moving forward to what we're proposing, I would just like to give a brief introduction or a, or a brief summary of how the political context looks like in this area. Um, so we have the four countries, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, and Ecuador, and for many years, the four governments have been trying to address the management of the Eastern Tropical Pacific together, jointly. Um, they have developed agreements, they have developed cooperation strategies, um, and they have done several things to try to protect this place. But, um, well, even at a, at, at more recently, both countries, uh, including like both countries, Costa Rica and Ecuador have committed to protect 30% of their oceans. But in reality, um, both countries are very far away from achieving these objectives. So what is it that we're proposing? Um, we believe that it's the right moment to take further actions. And, and we believe that we need more tangible actions right now if we want to protect highly migratory species. And how we foresee this, and I'm talking specifically for the marine corridor that connects Cocos Island, which is a World Heritage Site, and the Galapagos Island, another World Heritage Site, is to protect this area here in the middle. Um, this area is precisely, it covers the sea mounts and the marine corridor used by different highly migratory species, and that it's currently unprotected. Um, it's important also to mention that there are other conservation initiatives in the area. For example, there's this great initiative in Ecuador right now in which several organizations are trying to increase the protection that surrounds the Galapagos Marine Reserve. Of course, this will be uh, very beneficial for the initiative that we're trying to move forward. The thing right now is that um, if you see the map, this is a big area and we need governments to really show political will to move this forward. Um, they have gone to the international community showing a big commitment, but now we need this commitment to become a reality. And this is where uh, we all became, uh, become a big part of the game because we need to convince these governments that this is the right thing to do. I know that um, time is very limited and that I can talk for hours and hours and hours about how much I love this place. Uh, just before beginning the presentation, we were all discussing how Cocos is one of the most amazing places. Uh, of course, Galapagos is also, it's an incredible place. And I can also talk for hours about the challenges that both governments are facing, the challenges that species here are facing, um, but time is really limited. So just before ending my presentation, I would love to ask you guys for a big favor. Please visit our website, seaturtles.org. We have a special section um, for the Cocos Galapagos Swimway we have a petition here 
that is addressed to both governments, the government of Costa Rica, the government of Ecuador. We need to encourage them to do the right thing. We need to protect highly migratory species. We need to protect the, the swimway that they're using to interconnect both World Heritage sites. And please share this petition with your friends, your loved ones, your colleagues. Um, and of course, I'm open to any question, comments that you may have, um, suggestions on how to do this better. Um, the only thing I can say right now is that the only way in which we can move this forward is acting all together. Thank you. Very Fantastic. Much. Thank you. And as most of us know who've been there, this truly is one of the most amazing places on the planet. And it's such an important point and really pioneering to protect areas of open ocean and international or multinational waters. It really is a challenge. But if uh, any of you are divers and ever been to Cocos, if you've ever been to uh, the Galapagos or Malpelo, this Hammerhead Highway, it's just extraordinary. And you see how important it is to protect these animals because you see how beautiful they are in person. So that was fantastic. Thank you, Mariano. Hi, I'm David McGuire with Shark Stewards. We're here on Endangered Species Day with experts on whales, sharks, sea turtles, as we just heard, and manta rays. So next up, we have my good friend, Dr. Robert Rubin of Santa Rosa City College. Uh, he's a, a biologist, a scientist, the founder of the Pacific Manta Research Project or group, I think. He's been on the board of the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary uh, for a long time, maybe since the beginning, Bob, uh, one of our National Marine Sanctuaries off the West Coast. Uh, he's been studying manta rays as a scientist and as a teacher for over 40 years. So over to you, Dr. Robert Rubin, welcome. Thank you. And thank you folks for looking in. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be able to share these magnificent animals with you. Um, it's my impression that they're the most magic beasts that have ever lived on the planet. Um, there would be argument from my friends who study sharks and lots of turtles and lots of other things, but I love these guys like breath itself. As <clears throat> mentioned, I've been working on these animals for four decades. And one of the things that we began with was looking at pattern recognition on their undersides. We recognized that the animals have unusual markings on their, on their belly sides, if you will, that can be used uh, in identification like a fingerprint. And so at this point, we have about 35,000 pictures of manta rays, um, worked in computer programs in a number of different ways. And we know about 900 animals from a specific location off the coast of Baja California called the Riviagueros Islands. The patterns have given us a lot of information, not only to identify the animals and to know their behaviors, but also to look at their movements between the islands and among the islands and then over long distances. And we recently have begun work not only on the patterns and the recognition of the animals, but also on their movements over long distances. And these are, the, these are similar swimways, we think. We have a fair amount of data from Baja California and the Sea of Cortez that shows the animals that we were studying in those areas in the uh, mid 80s have been overfished, we believe, or have disappeared from the, um, the Sea of Cortez. And the last animal I saw in the Sea of Cortez was in 1985. And so we began at the Rivia Hejedos um, shortly uh, thereafter. <clears throat> and <clears throat> now are looking at animals that move between the Sea of Cortez and these islands, which are those, those movements are about 600 kilometers, uh, and also move to the bay of the city of Puerto Vallarta and along the coast of Mexico across the Sea of Cortez. And so we're starting to get a handle on their, sea, their migratory movements and their their transport across large oceanic masses. Um, it leads to protection of them in part and also to recognize the critical habitats. We also recognize that mantas are kind of very unusual uh, evolutionarily. They've only been on the planet perhaps a, a million years or less. They are the most highly derived uh, of the 
uh, Lasmobranch fishes, the sharks and rays, and they have a number of unique characters, including very large brains. Those very large brains are also unusual in that they're heated by a countercurrent heat exchange system that comes from uh, muscle activity when they swim. And so large brains and heated brains are unusual character for warm-blooded fishes related to sharks. Their behavior is extraordinary. And we're starting to think that there's something very special about them. The islands had a great deal of fishing pressure at one time, and we were successful in writing a proposal to UNESCO about converting the islands into a World Heritage Site. Um, the proposal was denied at the onset because Cocos and Galapagos are very similar and they felt that they didn't need another similar habitat. However, in convincing them or at least writing to them and telling them about manta behavior and their curiosity toward people, um, their friendliness toward people. And in the early days when it was allowed uh, and nobody knew much more about them we rode them and they, come, they came to us with great warmth as far as we could tell, allowed us to ride over and over and over again. And if it wasn't in poor taste now, I would do it every day. Um, it, is, it is a magic event and they are magic, magic animals. We did get the UNESCO approval for the islands to be converted into a World Heritage Site and it has changed significantly the fishing pressure on the animals and also uh, hopefully extending uh, their population sizes. They breed uh, uh, in places that we don't know. Uh, the gestation period is only a, about a year, which is surprising perhaps uh, for one pup. And the pup is nourished in the uterine cavity by milk coming from the mother's body wall. Here you, you can see uh, mantas in different uh, positions in the Riviera Hejeros. Um, their unique behavior and their magic behavior for most people has led to an annual figure in Mexico of about a million dollars a year per animal economically. And we think that that compares favorably with their worth in the market if they're dead of about $200. So the, the effort from studying them in depth and also being able to show the economic benefit has been a great asset in establishing habitat safety for them, at least at this one location. We also are doing educational things and I firmly believe that the survival of the planet lies in the hearts and minds of our children. And I hope very much that as we continue with mantas and turtles and sharks and whales and dolphins and all of the things that are so charismatic in the world's oceans that we can stimulate interest and excitement and appreciation and love in our children so they'll take care of them in the future after we've done the very best we can to inform them about their beauty and elegance. I think I'll stop there. I thank you for your attention and I wish you all well. Thank you very much, Bob Rubin. Um, that was incredible. And your wealth of experience is just uh, extraordinary. And <laughs> writing mantas, yeah, probably not so PC anymore. But I remember when I was studying gray whales as a kid, guys would tell me to jump on the back, but I had the prudence not to jump on the back of a whale. Um, but they are truly amazing and mystical animals and uh, increasingly endangered around the world. And uh, so this is Endangered Species Day and hosted by Shark Stewards with the Earth Island Institute. If you're just joining, hi, I'm David McGuire. We've got Mark Palmer from the International Marine Mammal Project, Kristen Monsell, who spoke about her work on policy protect, or their work, the Center for Biological Diversity's work, uh, protecting endangered whales, threatened whales from entanglement and ship strikes, not only on the West Coast, but also on the East Coast. Uh, we heard from Mariano Castro about the Galapagos and Cocos Swimway, protecting these multinational waters of these migratory species that are protected in these World Heritage Sites, but they are highly vulnerable to fishing, to entanglement, bycatch, but also shark finning, 
during their migratory pathway to Central America. And there is a petition online that I just put into the Facebook page that you can help Turtle Island uh, achieve this multinational protection for these amazing species. So next we're gonna go to Vince Smith of uh, Blue Endeavors. And Vince is a, a dive master, a dive master, an instructor. Of course, he's a dive master too. Uh, he's a deep diver. He's an educator, uh, the founder of Blue Endeavors. He's now up in Bellingham, Washington. He was in the Bay Area. I think he's in, he said he, he's in Oakland now. Uh, he had a shop over in Alameda. Maybe there'll be a shop again, but we are working together, Shark Stewards and Blue Endeavors, to try to see these manta rays off Socorro Island in the Reviajeros off Mexico, now a marine protected area, also a world heritage site, and also one of these hot spots for these incredible migratory pelagic species. So Vince, over to you. I'm hoping everybody's seeing this incredible picture of these yeah. divers. Thank you, David, for the great introduction. Uh, so yes, I'm with Blue Endeavors. We're a nonprofit for ocean conservation, restoration, and exploration. And our mission is to empower everyone to help save the oceans. And so what you're looking at on the screen is an, one example of how we do that. So we work with students and community scientists and actually get everyone underwater working on expeditions. This one in particular is about data collection. So if you can, that's actually a high school student. If you could see they're holding a slate and they are taking measurements on the Manta, they're identifying the spot pattern. So later on the boat, they can look at the databases that like Dr. Rubin mentioned to learn more about these animals. They're also taking water temperature location and a host of other uh, information. So we, we get asked all the time by people who watch you know wonderful documentary hear one of our wonderful speakers talk and they say you know what can we do and so up to this point you've heard a lot of great suggestions by all of these speakers about um, petitions about letting your local politicians and representatives know that you care about these issues and how important they are to you which is huge uh, we also want to get you underwater and to start collecting data so no matter if what your day job is, or if you're still a student, we want you to come out with us. And we need these large data sets so that when we want to apply or other wonderful organizations want to apply to create a marine protected area, we need data to support that. Um, we still need data to learn more about these wonderful animals. And, and along the way, you get connected. I mean, like Dr. Rubin was talking about, you know, if you actually spend time with these animals in the water, coming up to you and having these experiences, there's really no way you can't be very motivated to do whatever you can to protect them, to make sure your children are going to be able to see them and to really fight for these ecosystems and this biodiversity. Um, so that uh, photo is actually taken at Roca Partida. We are going back with shark stewards and part of it is going to be a, a student competition to work on improving hardware and software solutions to even facilitate data collection in the future, to make it even easier for future community scientists and future students. Uh, so if you are out there and you're interested in getting involved, uh, reach out to us and, and come out. You can come out to uh, Socorro, to Roca Partida, help us collect information on mantas. Uh, we also have projects where you can help in um, other areas and in coral and ocean plastics and, and do that in a very hands-on way. Uh, if you love the ocean, but maybe aren't a diver and are not uh, able to come out with us, we also offer a lot of events. Like we have Sharktoberfest as an annual event supporting the great work that Shark, uh, Shark Stewards does. Um, we did a, uh, with Dr. Rubin, a, a Manta event to again, kind of just let the world know about these incredible animals and why it's just so critical that we do whatever we can to, uh, to support them and to protect them. Thank you, Vince, well said. And if you wanna learn more, you can go to blueendeavors.org or sharksewers.org about that manta ray expedition and some of this pattern recognition work that we're trying to explore, not only for mantas, but for other pelagic sharks. And the cool thing is you don't have to tag them you can take a photograph and you can identify the new individuals as well as uh, individuals you've seen in the past. That gives us information about movements, about population, uh, about a number of other characteristics without 
being intrusive. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm hoping that everybody's seeing a beautiful sperm whale. <laughs> Can you give me a thumbs up or no? Because I can't tell every time I, mm -hmm. yeah, great. Um, so welcome to Endangered Species Day. We're gonna keep going. We'll go over because we have a lot of questions and also because of our technical difficulties, which I do apologize. I'm David McGuire with Shark Stewards. We're just coming in and we are celebrating the magnificent marine megafauna of the ocean and also advocating and working to save it from extinction. So Simon Christopher is a, a scuba diver. He started a company called Scuba Zoo in Borneo, Malaysia. Uh, gosh, I don't know. He'll tell us, but maybe 30, 40 years ago. He's a photographer, a cinematographer. Uh, he is an advocate. He's worked very hard towards increasing protected areas and protecting dive sites, uh, communicating, producing films like Blue, or Blue Planet with Sir David Attenborough. He's worked with Sylvia Earle. He's done a lot of incredible programming, uh, including series Borneo from Below and uh, an online series, now in its second iteration, I think. And uh, Simon is now the founder of Blue Hope. Uh, he's been working in Timor-Leste, where I had the incredible opportunity to join him and a team to help establish a hope spot with Dr. Sylvia Earle with the local uh, um, Maritime Association of Tourism. Uh, he was working in Malaysia, trying to reduce plastic, making that country plastic neutral. So Simon, can you hear me and are you on? Yes, David, hi. Hi everyone, thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome uh, everyone, looking forward to talking uh, with you, sharing a bit of uh, our story over here in Borneo. So um, yeah, I, I, I came over to, I, I'm a marine biologist and I came over here uh, in search of the best diving. And uh, in about 1995, and, and arrived here and never left uh, because there was more, uh, more stories really. Uh, we're part of the Coral Triangle here. You have six countries, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Timor-Leste, um, Papua New Guinea and Solomons. And between those six countries is about 4% of the world's surface area, about the size of the states. And it's generally regarded as there's more biodiversity in that 4% than the rest of the planet combined, which is a pretty, pretty staggering statistic. So there are more stories there, and I'm essentially a storyteller. So I spent the last 25 odd years bringing the underwater world, what is generally out of sight, out of mind, and trying to bring it into the lives of people and make it relevant. Um, and <clears throat> I think the most exciting thing now is that we have, uh, everyone is, connected or, or a lot of the world is connected. And unfortunately, tragically for a lot of people uh, through COVID, we've, we've had this nature shock. And what that has done is, um, has, is, is it made us essentially assess value and rethink the way we interact with, with, with the natural world. We, we, we got into the spot because of our lack of harmony with nature. And so what we have now is uh, as we all try and um, get control of this virus rather than have it control us, uh, which is taking a lot longer than uh, we, we hope. We're still uh, we're discovering it's about in innovative virus. But what it means is there's a lot of people online staying at home and, and understanding a little bit more that we, we've really got to connect with our remaining biodiversity. So um, the thing that's really exciting for me as a storyteller is we, we're starting the UNESCO Ocean Decade, where all the um, scientists and the people who've been studying uh, biodiversity recognize the ocean is actually um, the, the, the focus and where we need to focus our activities. More of the air that we're breathing as we sit here and have this conversation comes from the ocean. And um, we, we, really, we really know so little. And so uh, UNESCO Ocean Decade is, is really about um, um, looking at the ocean, understanding the ocean, listening to ocean, and uh, working out how to protect it and how to protect the creatures that a lot of my colleagues on this panel are uh, working so hard and working so hard for all of their lives to protect. Uh, you cannot protect an area until you know what's in it, and, and uh, a lot of the species, they move. So you can ring fence an area, but if the animals are moving half of the, half of the year uh, out of that area, then obviously become very vulnerable. So 
really this next decade is about um, understanding these last uh, pockets of biodiversity and totally uh, ring, ring fencing them and vigilantly and vehemently protecting them because biodiversity is really the future. Um, so, you, so Blue Hope is really about starting this new movement into the, the most um, last bastions, the last biodiversity centers uh, in Timor-Leste and Sabah and building a global movement. Um, and plastic is, is one of the big stories because there's more of it in the planet than, than ever. And we're just using more and more of it every single day. And plastic is such a, a gate, gateway issue. And the thing about plastic is everyone understands it, everyone uses it. So it's very relevant. And so it's the segue into the, the broader um, environmental issues. Um, David, do we have a video? I, I'm not sure if you've got a video that maybe we could play. Um, yeah. Just to sort of, just to, to show the kind of storytelling that we're doing. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with Sir David Attenborough, as you say. And um, one of the videos that we've done recently to launch Blue Hope, uh, I'd just like to show that and then that'll uh, spawn a, a bit more about what I'd like to say and then we can bring it, take it out to the floor and answer some questions. Yeah, we're ready to queue it up, Simon. Thank Every you. Every one of us should be extremely proud of their natural heritage and passionate to protect and conserve it and ensure that it remains around for future generations. We all have a responsibility to care for our planet. The future of humanity and indeed all life on Earth now depends on us. Thank you very much and good luck. And Simon has several of these videos uh, with Sir David, who's obviously such a charismatic and influential person for wildlife. Thanks, David. So, so the point is, um, it's all about value. Um, and for a lot of, particularly because of COVID now, obviously, um, it's all about putting food on the table. And in Asia, um, you know, the, the, the point is that um, for all of us who, who love wildlife and get the, 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 have the uh, privilege and are able to see wildlife, that's great. But meanwhile, there are millions of people in the Coral Triangle who wake up in the morning have seven or eight mouths to feed and they literally don't know how they're going to feed their kids that day. Um, and so the reality is that we've got to, uh, from, from my perspective, uh, the next 10 years is all about uh, making that biodiversity worth more to them alive than dead on a dinner plate, um, um, either to feed their families or in the form of shark fin soup or pangolins or so. So we've really got to, we've got to really uh, readdress the value. And I think, the power of the internet and a big movement with some big voices with the UNESCO Ocean Decade will allow us to, um, to, to refocus and, and try and connect people with wildlife. And uh, in Asia, um, people are just not quite so connected to, to biodiversity and habitat, and it's much more a resource. Whereas uh, I've been very lucky to, uh, in the UK, we've heard Sir David Attenborough since I was uh, a tiny, um, uh, but we, we, so we have that kind of, we've, we've always had that kind of, we, we see value for, for wildlife, but the, the point is that uh, for a lot of people, it's just food. And so we've got to really um, show the importance of biodiversity. So it's education and awareness. And for, for, for Blue Hope, it's essentially taking the words of Sir David, age 95, um, Sylvia Earle, uh, about 80, 85, I think, and, and taking uh, their, their incredible words and, and passing the bat on to the youth. So we're going to create a big Blue Hope youth movement and, uh, and try and empower everyone to, to appreciate the, the value of biodiversity in this megafauna that we're, we're all talking about today. I think I'll leave it at that, David, because I, I think we should throw it out to the floor and answer some questions. But lovely to be here. Great to meet you all. And uh, looking forward to talking, uh, talking more over the next uh, 20, 30 minutes. Thank you. That's great, Simon. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you soon. Again, unfortunately, remotely because of the pandemic, it's such a challenge to get to Asia. I've been champing at the bit to get to Singapore, uh, to get to Indonesia, and of course, Malaysia, where we're trying to increase marine protection and shark protection. And also your good work, making it plastic neutral. Um, I did want to share one slide. We have a lot of questions. I think we can go probably 10 more minutes if the, you will bear with us. 
there, there have been a lot of comments and it looks like we've had success after our, our little snafu. Uh, so there are just one more thing I really wanted to show because it kind of nicely summarizes a lot of the things that people have been saying here on Endangered Species Day. So we're almost wrapped up with the speaking and now we're gonna to get to your questions on Endangered Species Day. Uh, we just heard from Simon Christopher all the way across the Pacific and Southeast Asia where there's a huge growing population, huge impacts, many people reliant upon the ocean for their food. Uh, also, we all rely on the ocean for our air, for our recreation, for our livelihoods, particularly when you're committed to saving endangered marine megafauna. So there's been quite a bit of science that's been being published. I mentioned the nature study about a 71% decline in the biomass of all sharks and rays uh, since commercial fishing really be began in effort 50 years ago. Uh, but other species, marine megafauna, which are defined as around 45 kilograms and more, which is around 100 pounds. So sea turtles, but dugongs, whales, dolphins, uh, I think even sea otters may qualify, but at the lower end. But many of these species that mean so much to us that are so beautiful also have this incredibly important role in their ecological niche that they survive in and that they thrive in if we allow them to. And the study that was published in uh, Science Advances last year, about a year ago, that talks about threats to marine megafauna the species that are going extinct are almost going extinct, the rate that they're going extinct, not only the impacts of the species, but the, the ecological niches that they are associated with. So at, in the next 100 years, at the species of decline extinction that we've been experiencing, uh, we'll have another 18% of loss of, of large uh, fish and marine mammals and reptiles uh, with an associated 11% uh, loss in their niches or animals that rely on them and plants. Uh, in the worst scenario, 40% will be extinct in hundred years with almost half. And among those sharks and rays have some of the most serious impacts with the most aso serious associated ec ecological impacts. So having these animals are extremely important because they are functionally unique and they're specialized and increasingly endangered. So we have a lot of work to do. We're asking you to volunteer to share our work on social media, to share it with your friends, share this video on YouTube or whatever you do, TikTok, Facebook, Snapchat, your social media of choice. Uh, please sign the petitions that we'll have up on our website and we'll put up on Facebook and let your legislators know that saving the ocean is critical for saving humanity, including the health of the human race. And of course you can donate. We have a spring drive trying to, to carry the, the football across the line with the Federal Shark Fin Elimination Act now in its fourth introduction in the US Congress to become the single largest nation that would prohibit the sale and trade of shark fin. And shark fin is of course the blood diamond of the ocean. Uh, it's like the sea turtle legs. It's like the rhino horn. We're going after these animals for their body parts for a luxury that is unneeded. The animals are worth far more alive then they are dead as we heard from uh, Dr. Rubin and Vince and also Simon. We know that diving with these animals is bringing more money through ecotourism services than they are for $100 for a set of fins. So thank you to all of my guests, to my board, to our volunteers. Uh, I especially want to thank you, our audience here on Facebook and on YouTube for participating, for acting, for caring, for loving and supporting these, the ocean and the animals that we love. So you can find our friends here uh, on their websites and you can contact them through their websites as well if you wanna communicate with them. Uh, I think all of, everybody's got a Facebook page or some kind of social media and they will be linked on the sharkstewards.org page as well. So we got through that part and now we have a lot of questions, which is pretty cool. 
uh, they've been coming and it's kind of distracting, you know, it's like you're getting ding, ding, ding. It's like when you have Slack or something and you're, uh, there you go, inside show. Um, you're trying to concentrate and then the bells are ringing and the tweets are tweeting. And <laughs> so the first question, uh, do oceanic white tips and whales ever interact in the wild? And that's really interesting because I'm over in Hawaii actually to focus on protecting oceanic white tips of which we estimate there are only 95% left in the Pacific Ocean. These are one of the most abundant sharks, the lone wolves of the seas. They were hugely abundant. They're curious, they're incredibly beautiful, uh, but they're increasingly becoming extinct. They're critically endangered. Um, do they ever interact? Well, the, here off Hawaii, they actually see pilot whales. I'm oh, sorry, I'll take this one because I'm experiencing this. Uh, the oceanic white tips follow the pilot whales and other whales and they'll eat their poop uh, or their placentas or sometimes they'll actually try to get the, the young or the sick. So you'll see the, the oceanic white tips hanging out and following uh, these marine mammals. And, and that's a good thing. Their role is to be the uh, the surgeons, the sanitarians, they keep the ocean clean and healthy, and sometimes they take out the trash. Uh, so I don't want to talk about great whites here, but uh, oh, here's one for Bob or Vince. Uh, are the front lobes on manta rays used for swimming? I think they mean those mandibular extensions. Well, they, they really aren't. They are modified portions of the pectoral fin, um, and they're used primarily for uh, scooping food into the mouths like little spatulas. And so when the mantas feed, they, they put them to the side of their faces and create a vortex of water into their mouth and pick up large groupings of, of plankton. Um, in addition, they're sensory organs and they allow the mantas to get uh, some feel for electrical fields around them. Um, and we have a lot of uh, substantial evidence indirectly from watching them and being around them, that they are getting image fixations of us. Uh, do they put them into memory with these electrical images? Um, we're starting to think so. And so they're unusual structures um, for feeding and also for sensory perception, and they don't involve in swimming at all. Good question. Yeah, good question. And I think I, you, you had mentioned how recently evolved manta rays are compared to other elasmobranchs, but also how specialized they are in their brain function in this, uh, I guess it's the Ricci Mariable, right? The network of, yeah, of yeah. Uh, capillaries. And so just incredibly uh, evolved, adapted and relatively short period of time for manta rays, evolutionarily speaking. Yes. Uh, so we have tagging questions. People are fascinated by tagging and I've done quite a bit of tagging with white sharks uh, and seven gills in California, but uh, somebody asked about uh, how, what's a safe way to tag a shark? And, <laughs> or, um, you know, obviously very carefully, but also with prudence, also looking at cost benefit, because there are actually some very invasive or harmful methods of tagging. But, um, you know, going back to some of your work with, with manta rays, uh, or Mariano, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've tagged some of the hammerheads, which are really elusive and hard to tag because you don't want to catch them because they're so sensitive. So any comments on tagging the best methods, uh, your experience with that? Start with Bob and we'll go to Mariano. Well, we've, we've been very successful with tagging um, by using small, small barbs that go into the dorsal surface of the skin where there isn't a great deal of blood flow and also there's stiff, heavy connective tissue. So the animal is not harmed. The animal's big, of course, but um, and the barb is very small and it carries acoustic tags and other arrangements. Um, as you know only too well, you can uh, tag sharks and you could tag mantis this way as well by putting small probes through the dorsal fin. And a lot of the seaway, uh, seaway studies have been done with tags through the dorsal fin. They stay on um, for a long period of time and they're fairly easy to attach if you kind of know what you're doing. Yeah, great. And, and I guess going over <clears throat> to um, actually to Vince before Mariano uh, about the pattern. I mean, you, it sort of obviates or excludes the need to actually tag animals in many cases, as long as you can see them visually or within a, a, an area. 
So yeah. he's coming to get on the AI and. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's one of the things we're very excited about, especially with what you see coming out of the tech industry with um, AI and facial recognition, which we've been calling facial recognition. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to be able to uh, collect data uh, anytime we're in the water with these with these animals in a, in a touchless way as well. So I, I think it, it could also help to supplement and uh, increase the quantity of the data sets because um, I do know sensors are very expensive when we've looked into tagging. Um, it's a limiting factor for a lot of researchers, just how many tags you can get for smaller nonprofits um, as well. So I, I think... Uh, if we could get more people in the water collecting student data, um, community science data, we can really, uh, and using technology to do that even more efficiently, we can really kind of help the researchers in the field um, with these larger data sets. Yeah, great. And that's, you know, that kind of answers one of the other questions is, as a diver, what's the best way to help protect sharks and marine life when diving? And of course, participating in these citizen science programs that are hugely uh, popular. I naturalist at the California Academy of Sciences. We have Shark Watch looking at California sharks. Uh, we, did, we did start one and we want to actually recatalyze that in Malaysia to get divers to introduce their observations to get an idea of hotspots, aggregation, population densities to, pre to predict uh, mm -hmm. and protect. So I thought, so you, I think you said it. It's like, we need to know the data. Or Simon, Simon might've said it that you need to know what's there to protect it. You need to do the science and, and unfortunately, as, as well as the human impacts. Yeah, I would um, say if, if you're entering the water, I always like to say dive with a purpose. So I think for, for a long time and a lot of, especially scuba divers looked at it like almost like they were taking this experience from the ocean. And it's so much more meaningful for the individual if you could get into this activity with with that added purpose, what can you do to protect? So you get all the experience of these amazing animals in the water. You get these once in a lifetime experiences. And it, it's how can you use that to then facilitate some greater change to protect these animals? Uh, and, and so, and I, I think you get more out of it. And I think the, obviously the oceans will get a lot more out of it if you approach it from that standpoint. Well, yeah, I mean, that personal experience, I mean, Dr. Sylvia Earle, who we all love, says, you know, you, you have to see it and know it to protect it or to love it. And to love it, you'll want to protect it more. And so if you do see it, and divers in particular, we're all probably, I think every one of us may be divers, but you see it firsthand. We're so fortunate to have that experience and then to share that. Uh, so blueendeavors.org, if you want to volunteer uh, and participate or turn.org, um, or bluehope.org, or I'll have citizen science programs. Mariano, uh, how about, I, I think it would be really interesting if you speak about, you showed that, that uh, diagram with the hammerheads that go between the mainland and these islands, and tell us how you got, achieved that map. How did you get that data? So yeah, probably to address um, all the questions here, my first comment would be I'm a lawyer, I'm, so I'm not really the most adequate person to be tagging. Um, but let the experts do it. it. It's dangerous if you don't know how to do it for you and for the sharks. And, and probably this is why the best way to do it is to join this expedition, support the experts doing it. Um, that doesn't mean that you cannot participate as, as, as you guys mentioned before, it's amazing to see this. Um, it's also amazing if you love diving, it's even better if you know that you're helping. Um, so please do support uh, these great initiatives. And yeah, so precisely supporting these initiatives is what led us to get these results in the first place. Um, thanks to the support of hundreds of people around the world that have joined these expeditions, that have donated um, to these organizations, we can buy tags, whether they're satellite or acoustic tags. And, and by the way, they're not cheap. And these expeditions are not cheap. Um, I can speak for Cocos, for example, it's uh, 320 miles away from the coast. It takes you two days on a boat to get there. It's super expensive to be there. Um, and the only way to do it is with the support of the people. And with this support, we are able to get um, the information we need to further protect this species because otherwise we won't be able to uh, get the necessary resources to better understand where the species are, what are they doing? 
where are the exact places that we need to increase protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, I had the good luck <coughs> to accompany Todd Steiner, the founder mm -hmm. and director of Turtle Island Restoration Network and Randall Arras, uh, Pitoma, and tag hammerheads. And the way you tag those sharks are with a spear gun to get the acoustic tag in the back and to give some of that information. And satellite tags are, as you said, they're probably $5,000 or more a piece. Uh, they're heavier, they're a little more invasive, need a bigger shark and you need a bigger budget. Uh, but there's a lot of information that we can get through the acoustic tags, which is in the radio signal too. Again, looking at those movements, defining where these animals where you can't see. And for most of the times they're invisible to us. Uh, fortunately, whales are a little easier because you can see them, they're like us, they have to come up and breathe. So thank you, Mariano. I had one more question that's uh, maybe Mark and, and uh, Kristen can address. And it's about uh, whale, it kind of comes back to the whale and shark question because people are, I guess, fascinated by the shark whale interaction. And I mentioned one, but there are probably many. And is there a way that we can save whales and save sharks together? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. So Chris, I want to start with you and some of the policy perhaps, or maybe the Endangered Species Act, I don't know. Um, Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, what one thing um, I I would note, I think that is, you know, the the mitigation measures that have been put in place for um, trap pot and and gillnet fisheries off off all of our coasts, I think, help both whales and and sharks. Um, one thing that we've been advocating for is ropeless or on-demand fishing gear to be used in trap pot fisheries off California and in the Atlantic. Um, and they're starting to look at that for, for gill nets. That doesn't eliminate the um, panel and the risk of entanglement from the panel in a gill net, but it does eliminate the vertical line that runs through the water column that is what um, can often in entangle um, whales. And um, that, you know, that technology is based on um, technologies that e that's existed for various oceanographic con reasons for decades and has been developed with the input of, of fishermen and I think has real promise to um, solve the entanglement problem for good and while allowing fishing to continue because if you're you know eliminating the, the rope that's running through the water column you're eliminating the risk of, of entanglement. Yeah I would uh agree totally with Kristen. It's not an either or question. Uh, we can uh, protect whales and dolphins uh, and we can protect uh, the uh, sharks at the same time. Uh, they've lived uh, together for millions of years in the ocean uh, before humans came along and messed things up. So uh, it's not really an either or situation. Some sharks eat uh, marine mammals. Uh, some marine mammals like the orca eat sharks and rays. So, uh, but they, they do seem to balance out and uh, make uh, uh, themselves uh, part of the overall system that we have. That's a, a very uh, complex system, uh, ecosystem in the ocean uh, by eliminating gill nets in California waters as we did in the 1980s, we've been able to see uh, a comeback for some of these animals, including uh, the rays and, and sharks that were entangled in those gill nets, even though they were not the target of those gill nets, as well as the marine birds and the marine mammals that were also uh, entangled in those kind of gill nets. So changing the type of gear, uh, changing the direction. We have the Dolphin Safe program at Earth Island. In the late 1980s, we were seeing 80 to 100,000 dolphins a year being killed in tuna nets the official count from governor observers for uh, 2019, which is the latest number we have, is under 800 dolphins were killed. Uh, those dolphins were mostly killed by uh, fishermen who are not fishing dolphin safe. Unfortunately, we still have Mexico and some other countries uh, setting nets on dolphins and killing dolphins. But the dolphin safe program has been tremendously effective in reducing the number of dolphins being killed. So again, if you change these methods, uh, you can also uh, protect uh, the different species and it goes beyond just whales and dolphins or it goes beyond just sharks. Obviously, if we protect a large area of the Galapagos Islands surrounded with the Cocos Islands, 
we're protecting a lot of the marine mammals that utilize that area as well as uh, the sharks and other uh, migratory species. Yeah, that's a good point. And you mentioned the, the gill nets. Uh, and this was something that Shark Stewards has worked. Uh, and I know the Marine Mammal Project has historically and CBD uh, with, with Turtle Island. So four of our groups have worked to reduce or eliminate the impacts of bycatch off of California. And the final fishery that still exists, there is a drift gillnet fishery that is on its way out. And there's an act that uh, Feinstein reintroduced in this Congress that's currently in the, in the Senate. Uh, it's the Driftnet Modernization Act to end this deadly fishery that kills marine mammals, endangered sperm whales. It's been shut down by CBD and others by the, under the Endangered Species Act. It kills more sharks than anything else, 50,000 blue sharks in 10 years monitored, all tossed over the side. Uh, so this fishery is actually exists off of our coastline, off of Ventura, uh, off of LA, off of Santa Barbara. It's on its way out, phasing it out so that we can actually show people internationally and in the high seas where so much illegal and unregulated and unreported fishing is going on that we're actually taking steps at home. So there's actually a petition and information I just put up on Facebook. Um, we're getting late, it's Endangered Species Day and we've got covered a lot, we could keep going for hours, but I, I wanna finish, first I'll ask you, uh, besides your take action, if there's anything coming up, of course, World Oceans Day is coming up June 8th. Uh, and Simon, I, wanna end, I won't end with you, but I want to make sure that you get a chance to share, how can people during COVID over there in Asia, how can we support or participate with the work that Blue Hope is doing? Thank you, David. That's um, uh, really appreciated. I think the, I think the, the important thing is we all need to, to work together. Um, the only way we're going to change the, uh, the way things are going on the planet is if we all talk about it and we share about it. So everyone on this call, um, the reason you're connected to this because you believe in it and, and you are starting to love it or understand it. But with, that, with understanding comes love. And so the most important thing is, is, is bringing this incredibly important story, protecting our marine, our, our megafauna, um, these apex predators uh, that have such a huge impact on, on, on the ocean and therefore the air that we breathe. And it really is, it, it affects everyone, uh, but so many people are unaware. So the most important thing to do, you must come away from a lot of these, these kind of meetings thinking, well, how, what can I do? Well, the main thing you can do is talk about it. Um, share it with your friends. If you've got lots of friends who don't even know about this, share it with them. Uh, send them um, some of the websites. You know, D David's work with Shark Stewards is amazing. Uh, Blue Endeavor is getting involved. Um, it really is, uh, affects all of us. And so for Blue Hope, uh, we're a new organization. Uh, we're going to be launching officially soon. We just kickstarted a Saba Plastic Neutral with um, a Team One Leste Plastic Neutral. And plastics um, is something everyone understands. We've got to stop using plastics. So um, I think if you, if you can just uh, sign up to, to our, our Facebook and, and see what's coming, there's lots of news coming and we'll be working with David Sharks who's getting new, can't, get, can't wait to get you over here. It's just uh, trying, to, trying to find a gap to spring you over, magic carpet you over here during COVID. But the most important thing is, um, is talking to your friends, getting them interested, um, and uh, and one, once people delve into the underwater world through all these other great colleagues of, of mine, uh, what their work they're doing is fascinating work and it's relevant to everyone. So I think sharing is caring and communication now. Uh, youth is, is so important and that social media is such a powerful tool. And some of these stories, some of these wildlife is just, is just so fascinating, so important. So sharing and talking is probably the most important thing you can do if in fact you feel powerless. Um, get people involved, get them excited. Um, and, and I think that's the biggest thing I, I can leave with, we can end with uh, from my side. Thanks, David. Great, thank you and follow our work and we share your work and uh, World Oceans Day, I think you and I are gonna be do, doing something again, hopefully with yep. Sir David and others at, uh, live. So look at our websites, there they are. And also with Center for Biological Diversity and the Marine Mammal Project and many other nonprofits in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're going to be doing uh, a whale event. Uh, Kristen, you wanna 
do you have some details for that or should I show that? It's, it's uh, gonna be on our events page. Sure, I can talk about it very briefly. Um, it's going to be um, a sort of whale wake to um, raise awareness about all of the recent whale deaths that we've been seeing off California and elsewhere and um, educate people about the reasons why. So ship strikes, entanglements and, and climate change and not, you know, these whales not having enough um, enough food to eat um, and also a call to action to address those those three specific um, threats but yeah you can find out more information on our website and it's we're going to be having an event in the bay area so if you're in the bay area please uh come out to that we will be outside on a beach socially distanced thanks so much it's, that'll be really fun world oceans day of course is a celebration like earth day for the other 71 percent and we also take action. So we have a beach cleanup that we've been doing for six or seven years at Aquatic Park. Uh, Vince, do you have anything going on for World Oceans Day? Or are you going to have to come over uh, from Oakland and help clean up the that, beach with us? That's, I think we just learned what we're doing for World Ocean Day. This sounds fantastic. So we'll definitely be there to join in. Yeah. So it's an opportunity. Of course, you can go to the World Oceans Day website, wherever you live, and look at how you can volunteer, uh, bring a kid, Get the kid outdoors, get them near the ocean, show them how incredible this ocean planet is. If you can, I like to say, Sylvia says, if you have a kid, take them to the ocean. Uh, if you don't have a kid, borrow one. I like to take it one step further, take their head and stick them under water, stick it underwater. Of course, teach them scuba first so they can breathe <laughs> um, and show them how incredibly important the, the ocean is that we rely on, that we love. Clearly, everybody here in this incredible and endangered species day conversation is passionate, has lived a life of uh, committedness and, and consciousness. And thank you for all of your good work. Thank you to the audience, again, Earth Island Institute and uh, all our volunteers and, and our donors, because without you, we cannot do the work we do. So I think we're gonna end it. We're gonna put this on YouTube. It will live on Facebook and see you at our next event, possibly World Oceans Day, June 8th. So thank, thank you, you so much, panelists. Very, it was fantastic. I learned so much, had a great time. Take care. Thanks so much. Be Thank safe, you. everyone. Bye. Thanks, all. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.